Hey, can you hear me? Yes, I can. <laughs> I was having all of a sudden like, are we going to wear Zoom glitches? <laughs> no, it had that wild thing about um, where the host like doesn't allow people to unmute themselves. Yes, well, I was actually trying to do that on purpose because sometimes otherwise we get people that unmute themselves and then go on a thing. And so I was actually trying to, I was like, okay, how does this work? How do I let Diana unmute? I hear you. I hear you. How are you doing? Busy. I'm good. How about you? Um, yeah, same. <laughs> same. <laughs> <laughs> same Z's. Let's see. I spent last weekend up with my parents at our lake house where oh, I used to live in Ithaca. Was that was really nice and um yeah do you feel like rejuvenated a bit yeah I think I do yeah I just don't know how I'm like how do you recharge batteries <sighs> that's a you know, great it's just question. been a long time I think yeah yeah same here and there's just a lot going on, which reminds me, I want to call that young man, and I haven't yet, and I'm going to do so after this, uh, from the Air Force. Yes. Um, get out. Yeah, there's like a lot going on, and then it's also like you can't be part of everything. So it's yeah. like, who do you want to? Yes. Well, and I figure like with FOR, like conscientious objection is so fitting for us. And um yeah, and I don't know anything more than he wants to get out. But uh, yeah, we shall see. Hi, Susan. Oh, do I have to let you unmute? No, because you're automatically. Ah, uh, hi. Yes. Okay. Okay. Because I did a like, don't let people unmute because, you know, sometimes people unmute and we get background. But so we have to let individuals unmute. Okay. okay. And Ladies, can we just check I'm in here? In. Yes, please. Was Graylin asleep on the call last year? <laughs> oh, I was on by audio. I thought maybe he was driving. No, um, Graylin, Graylin has a health condition. Oh, okay, because I was like, oh my gosh, this is so and sweet. <laughs> it, has to, it has to do with his his voice box and his okay. landing, oh. and um, it, it, yeah, it went with. We continue to pray for him and we just thank God for every day that he's with us. But yes, it sounds like he's sleeping, but he's not. 
Well, I thought it was going to be kind of cool. I was like, finally, <laughs> somebody just like <laughs> owns it, <laughs> you know, when the meeting has gone on too long and they're just like, that's I'm it. Tired. <laughs> <laughs> no. But on another note, where's this gun, dude? Uh, he, I got a note back from him saying he registered, so he'd be on. Oh, and good. He must just be running a sit behind, and I'm looking for him. And in the meantime, oh, you met already, Diana and Mara. I did. Oh, I mean, I'm, in, I'm kind of like in love with uh, Marha's uh, newsletter stuff because I'm trying to work on my own or hire somebody. So I'm like looking to poach you, Mara. <laughs> I'm like, she likes Canva. Yeah, yes. she revitalized our graphics where mine were like always a some version of the same and she's like always creative. Honestly, I've been also copying a lot of like um, Red Christians. Is it Red Book Christians? Uh, Red, Letter Red Letter Christians. Red Letter, sorry. Red Letter Christians, like the format. I love it. I love how it's like not too red. Like there's just a good amount of red. You know what I mean? Yeah, they have, we have somebody who does it and she's super particular and it's really good because like then it looks really good. But I just always have a tough time because I'm like, I like it so profesh, but then I also just like want to throw a thousand colors at it and change it up. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. I'm the same way. Um, quick question before we start. Um, Ariel, um, Mara and I, um, uh, uh, do you want us to field like questions or keep Please. muted yeah. or you make sure that people are muted? Yes. Well, I, I put on a setting so people cannot unmute themselves unless we give them permission. Okay. You didn't have that problem because you logged on as admin. So you're so you were automatically a co-host, but like Diana and Mera, I um, I I asked them to unmute, and without that, people can't. So don't have, you don't have to worry about the muting. So is uh, so we make uh, Mara a co-host. Yes. Okay. All right. So basically, we'll just um, message you privately, Ariel, with any key questions. Yep. And make sure that we I don't know that we'll totally get time to many because we have two guests and so it can go, you know, yeah. fast. Well, yeah. I'm I'm always okay. worried about talking too much. So if I am making it short, it's only because I'm self-conscious about like taking up too much time or talking too much. So feel this, free to I think it gave it to you somehow. I did it like give host to you, which is fine. No, because I can still pin. I all of a sudden can't see any participants. It says only four. Just making sure that one of you two can. Oh, see. I see them. And you do. You see the whole of them. You oh, I see them too. Host? You want to make me to make you host? No, it totally doesn't matter to me. I just somehow it isn't showing the participants and I just worried ah. that they disappeared. Because I, I guess um, I saw like Zoom changed their some of their format in their app, which is uh, fine. I just then I just got worried that we were going to have some like funny okay. glitch. Well, <laughs> right, Ariel, Ariel, now I'm back to four. So can you Me? make? Yeah, okay. and... yeah. It's more important that you be a, a host. Yeah, now okay. I can see them all. So this must be a new like Zoom thing. That, that that's what I mean when I. See said it uh okay, okay now I'm making you co-host tell me if you need to be host host I see him again we're good okay and I see Iskander so yeah. I'm letting him in yeah so I think this new like I don't know I I think Zoom did some formatting updates or something which is fine we're just just first time seeing that okay and um uh, Mara if you could put for by your oh, yeah Absolutely. In myself. Okay. And we have to let Skandar still joining, and then we have to let him unmute. I'm going to admit him. Yes, I did, but it didn't let me, or it was slow, or I don't know what it did. Like I said, there seems to be a new uh, <laughs> Zoom funniness. Okay, we're at 402. 
Okay, let's give it another one minute, say. Okay, uh, we want to let folks in. Let me mute all of them. They should be. Oh, I'm muted. Uh, I think you're on mute. And I think everyone's automatically muted. Okay. Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining us for this special edition of Fellowship of Reconciliations Gathering Voices. Uh, we're just going to wait a couple seconds here to allow anyone else to come into the room. For anybody who's new to the Fellowship of Reconciliation, we are the oldest interfaith peace and justice organization in uh, both the US and the world. We formed in 1914 in Europe and 1915 in the US to support at that time conscientious objection to World War I. And we have continued to work for peace and justice through the um, prophetic, prophetic um, tools of nonviolence uh, since then, in, including today, continuing to support conscientious objectors um, across the world. And uh, Gathering Voices is a monthly conversation that we have with faith leaders, uh, grassroots organizers, and the like. And uh, today's Gathering Voices is, is a special one because uh, we have at Fellowship of Reconciliation, we have a, a fellowship that we give out and it's in honor of uh, Walter Wink and his wife, June Keener Wink. Walter was a prophetic um, theologian and uh, he, he and June, teachers of nonviolence and um, moving of, of faith so that to make sure that it uh, and that it incur that it includes um, and surrounds all of us um, with love and with uh, the power to build a better world. And June herself uh, is also um, a dancer and an artist um, as a as a form uh, to teach and participate in uh, the power of love through nonviolence. And so we have, uh, we, the, our fellowship start uh, in the month of May, which was Walter's birthday, Walter has since passed. And so last month we brought two new fellows on and uh, this conversation, this gathering voices today is for the purpose of letting you all get to know them a bit and getting to hear a bit uh, their thoughts on some of the work of Walter Wink and the opportunity to uh, travel with Fellowship of Reconciliation in this time. So uh, Diana is a dear friend of mine in recent years and we just became fast friends because what a what a powerful woman she's a um she was a, a combat medic during the Iraq war and you'll hear from her about her extraordinary courage as she was confronted with the truth of god of god's truth uh not to kill and instead to build a world uh with the tools of love and then how she has brought that into her family, raising two sons in the Midwest, and, and you'll hear a lot more about that. And Iskandar is our first Muslim Wink fellow, and a um, his work spans Islamic liberation theology and decolonial theory and Islamophobia studies. And I have to say, I am new to Islamic liberation theology, and I am so excited to uh, be embarking on this journey uh, of learning and exploration with him. 
He spent the past 15 years in South Africa. He's a Palestinian American, been in South Africa for the past 15 years and just, just returned. And so there's just, there's so much there. And with that, I am going to uh, bring them both on and welcome them. So welcome Diana and Iskandar. I'm looking for you to bring you on. With Hello a... everyone. It's lovely to be here with you. Let's... Greetings, good morning, good afternoon, good there night. You are. You are. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, welcome to both of you. Oh, Iskandar, first of all, where are you? And and I said that I, I think you've made it to the US. Um you know, uh, humans make plans, and then God laughs, laughs at us. So I am, I'm in South Africa, but I won't be in the States soon. <laughs> well, welcome from South Africa. I had a feeling I should ask, because I know God's plans are <laughs> so all over the place. And I also know it's quite late there. So thank you for staying up and... Um, joining us. And so I wanted to to start out, I want to, the way I'm hoping to frame this conversation is for the first uh, section of it to be about each of you and like how you came to be uh, who you are. And then a bit of what you're doing today and uh, your thoughts on what's going on in the world today. Um, and then if we can, and then moving that a bit into, I pulled out some quotes from, from Walter Wink for us to uh, think on. So uh, Diana, if I could just start with you and, and just sort of a brief, like where you came from and where you're located, if you had to like sum it up in, in five minutes or less, what would it be? Well, it is such an honor to be a Walter Wink Fellow, and for everybody who is part of Fellowship of Reconciliation, it is a joy and a delight to meet you, because from where I grew up in northern Minnesota, I had no idea it existed. I never heard the word conscientious objector. I was the daughter of a Vietnam-era veteran. Both my mother and my father served during the Vietnam era, and then my grandpa and his grandpa. So... I grew up in a small town, a third generation army veteran, and we had more pine trees and lakes than people, but it was a small, I grew up in a small Baptist church, and that's where I was really taught what Christianity was and what faith was. Downside, I didn't hear anything else about other, <laughs> other ways to practice faith, but I came from a small town that if you summed it up in a bumper sticker, it would be God, guns, and country. But the danger of that single story is that it's leaving out that, like many of us, we grew up, we were raised by people who, um, good people who loved God and loved us. And they also believed in violence as a way of life, as just a necessary part of life. And so that's really where I started, and I joined the military because I wanted to go to college, and I wanted, actually, I wanted to be a doctor, and my parents had love but no money. So like many people in smaller towns, we joined the military in order to go to college or to get um, a profession. So that's where I started, and then I ended up being sent to the Iraq war in part of the invasion. I was a combat medic during the invasion in 2003 and completely changed everything that I thought I knew to be true about myself, about my country, when I was asked to be willing to run over a child. And so I had to write a whole book about it, but it it's a wild experience to have everything that you believe be thrown in your face and you argue with yourself and say, I know this is fine, but it's not okay. And so I ended up laying down my weapon, becoming a conscientious objector, even when I didn't know what it was. Um, and it was the best thing that ever happened to me. So that is my uh, two second introduction. And plus, because I grew up Baptist, I had no idea that there was any type of Christians or faith tradition that didn't believe in guns and war. Like when I found out about it, it is like news to me. So just in case you want to, you know, stereotype people from small towns, I really believe that 
um, the people who raise me and love me and love God, they all have possibility. I had possibility. We just aren't often given invitations outside of the cultural places that we're raised. So I'm really honored to be here and really grateful to have found the Fellowship of Reconciliation and investment in peace and justice and caring about our world this way. Uh oh, you're you're so, muted. So one of the things I love about uh, having you both as fellows at the same time, and this is new, this is the first time that we've done two fellowships at the same time, had two fellows at the same time, is uh, vastly different backgrounds, right? And I, I think that gives us opportunity for such learning from each other and such diversity. So Iskandar, if you could tell us a, a bit about where you come from. Sure. Um, first, I just wanted to say thanks to Diana. Uh, it's nice hearing more about you. Uh, we only met one time before this, so I look forward to to hearing a lot more about you. I mean, I really appreciated what you shared about the difficulty in understanding, you know, just how communities actually are, you know, and not just the stereotypes about them. Um, there's a lot of love even in, you know, we all come from messed up communities. So I just, I appreciated that um, that aspect of what you were sharing. Um, but yeah, I, I, I'm thankful uh, to be here on this call with, with all of you and to uh, the fellowship uh, and the fellowship of reconciliation for this opportunity. Um, I am from uh, Los Angeles, California, uh, born and raised. Um, I come, uh, I mean, I, I, I identify as a Palestinian American, I guess now South African of sorts, I don't know. Um, but I am, uh, I'm mixed. My father's side is Arab and comes from Muslim heritage. And my mother's side is uh, a white American of German Irish uh, heritage and, and Catholic. Um, I was primarily raised by a single mother um, who, uh, yeah, I mean, for much of my young life, worked uh, two to three jobs to uh, put food on the table. Um, and uh, I was raised nominally Catholic, actually. Um, so it was kind of a bit later in life that I, you know, I conscientiously came to faith uh, and spirituality and religion. And um, yeah, it was a bit of a, a long journey of discovering who I was, um, you know, spiritually uh, and reconnecting to my ancestry, um, but also realizing where I fit in the world and how I can contribute politically. Um, and, you know, that's that's how I came to, to Islam. Um, I was, uh, I think about 21 years old, if I'm, if I'm remembering correctly, um, I was uh, in university uh, in Los Angeles, I went to a, a Jesuit university, um, Loyola Marymount University, um, and I initially started as a business major, um, and I, mean, I don't know why, you know, it's just, you know, you're kind of, you come out of high school, and what are you supposed to do? I just, you need to make money, is what the world teaches you, and what your parents want you to do, and this is how you survive, so... Um, yeah, when I kind of um, started to to wake up <laughs> to to you know conscientize myself about other issues and 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 realities, um, I like to say I came to the dark side, theology. Um, you know, a Jesuit university. One of the the requirements is to study theology and philosophy, and it was actually in a in a Jewish studies course with an Israeli professor. Um, that I was inspired <laughs> to choose theological studies. Um, but yeah, I think I came to my faith and I came to activism very much through a liberation theology lens. Um, I was um, kind of involved in environmental activism initially and then work around Palestine-Israel, um, a bit of, you know, kind of uh, the, the Chicano struggle in Los Angeles. I was very influenced, and I mean, I spoke Spanish before Arabic in my life. I was very influenced by Latin American culture growing up in Los Angeles. 
Um, and yeah, I, I, I got involved uh, in Palestine solid solidarity primarily um, through the student movement. And I remember prior to moving to South Africa, I worked with the Fellowship of Reconciliation, Jewish Voice for Peace, American Muslims for Palestine, and a number of faith-based organizations to try to put together an interfaith network for justice in Palestine. Um, and uh, yeah, it didn't really take off uh, in the way that we had hoped, but there may be a way we can revisit that sometime in the near future. So I'm kind of excited for that. Um, I came to South Africa to study Islam, uh, get a PhD in Islamic studies, but also engage in seminary studies. I've learned a tremendous amount being here. Uh, and now I'm, I'm moving back uh, to New York uh, with my wife. Um, I don't have a job, but I do have a sugar mama. My wife got a job. So I'm following her. <laughs> um, yes, yeah, so um, that's where we're at. And I just I just submitted my PhD, so. Exciting. So you, Iskander, I, I have somewhat of a, a similar story of my faith uh, in that I grew up almost entirely secular. I didn't know the most central prayer of Judaism. Um, yeah, like any of that. And it felt, and that was something that I explored later on. And I, I, at some point, I'd love to like have conversations with people about what that's like, that difference of, you know, finding your faith. I, I initially, um, I would take my children to Tot Shabbat at the synagogue. And it was like mm -hmm. my level too. And so I was like, this is great. <laughs> like we're, just, we're doing the basics. <laughs> and, and that's, what I was like, oh, good. Yep. Yeah, works for me. Diana, you, um, you know, you were raised steeped in in your religion, but if you could talk a bit about how your conception of 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 Jesus and and your faith um, changed for you, it's always really wild to grow up, and then you look back and you're like, whoa. I had no idea that this was the lens that I was raised. And it, it wasn't until, um, uh, I'd say a couple, I mean, we'll say 10 years ago, but I remember hearing the definition of fundamentalism. And I was like, whoa, I think I was raised fundamentalist because if only you were right and everyone else is wrong and the goal is to convert everybody... <laughs> to how you do it, that's a fundamentalist. And so I think I grew up in probably what is pretty average for a Baptist church. But what was pretty interesting to me now that I look back on it is that Jesus was always the central person in my faith. And I loved Jesus because actually he's like really still kicking butt and taking names as far as like disrupting world order. But many of the things that were commonly held, like the Ten Commandments, do not kill, all of these things, somehow there was just kind of this exception. There was always like, don't kill except for if it's for your country, except for if it's for your safety, except for. And so pretty soon, these basic things that I remember, because Baptists really love to memorize the Bible. We do Bible verses like you wouldn't believe. So there's what, when I finally had this mirror in middle of a battle, in a battle zone, what is always a, a hard thing for me is how much I had been taught something and yet wasn't able to see it in action and wasn't even able to notice that none of this was connecting. So Jesus was a central character to our faith, Jesus asked people to like put down their sword. He never touched violence, refused to touch it, even when his life was being taken. And for the central person that we kind of hung everything on, how his nonviolence and refusal for weapons, and also he told people to pay their taxes, like all of this kind of was erased in our practice. And I never noticed it um, until I got to war. And then I get to war 
And then all of a sudden I know that I know because I really do believe that like God has something good for us. And we're when we're at the moment minute of doing something that will forever harm our souls and another person, I think the divine shows up. And in my case, it did in a big way. I just kind of had this experience of hearing God. And so I found myself knowing that I knew that I knew that this thing that I was taught by my church, taught by my faith to do, which is take a life to save a life. I felt like God was standing in front of me saying, don't do it. I love them too, Diana. And so I knew it. And I was like, he's right. God's love. He loves people no matter who they're telling me is my enemy. But I found myself a complete outsider to the very faith that I had a belonging in. I found myself complete outsider to the country that I belong to. And I think that's still hard to this day because American Christianity is so militarized in just nationalism that it's just our country first and tagline second. Whatever God is, he is definitely third or fourth down that list. And so it was the best thing. I call it my desert baptism. Like it's the best thing that ever happened to me. Like I could breathe for the first time. I was reconnected to the brotherhood of uh, of humanity. Like I knew that I knew this was who I was. Like I was a peacemaker. But I also really found myself being... um you know, basically kicked out of these places that I really valued my belonging, my family, my faith, and even um, being in the military, if you don't really believe in killing, you won't kill for somebody, they have no use for you, and you become the enemy to them. So it was this freeing thing, but also the most devastating, lonely thing. But I think sometimes when you find your purpose, and... um There'll always be a small group of people who who you're willing, who get you, and who see this, and who want the best, um, but it will make you a foreigner to the things that, if you're no longer willing to tote other people's stuff first, it's a tough thing. So finding out a lot of my religion somehow had the words, but not the deeds, and now I find that um, the action is most important to me, not what somebody says, not their religion, but like, what are you doing is really the litmus test for who we are. So I'm going to switch directions a little bit and um, something current is on my mind as well. And Skandar, I, I want to ask you if you can explain to us um Islamic liberation theology, but then I also, and so if it works into that conversation, and if not, we can ask it, I want to ask it separately of both of you, um, but of it, I'll frame a part of it specific to you. So uh, in the news today, uh, in the US, Diana, you likely saw this at Esconder, maybe not across the world, uh, it, Louisiana just passed a law uh, to require the Ten Commandments um, in every school classroom. Esconder, I see that you didn't see that. <laughs> yes. Um, so, uh, so A, I wanted to hear about liberation theology, but then I would love thoughts of, um, because of course, yes, that's Louisiana, and you know, what are we going to expect from Louisiana, but this is also... Um, a piece of what is across, you know, happening across the United States of, uh, yeah, piece of Christian nationalism and its growth. So if those two bridge together and if not separately. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah. Um, I'll, I'll start with the first one. Um, Islamic liberation theology or, you know, a liberation theology approach to Islam. Um, I was actually just at a academic summer school in Spain, in uh, Granada, in, in Andalusia, um, lecturing on this. Uh, and I gave kind of an introductory uh, lecture on what is Islamic liberation theology, who are its main thinkers, what's its history, and um, it was kind of a more technical presentation. So I'm in my head, I'm thinking, okay, let's let's not go completely technical right now. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think like other 
like other faiths, other religions, um, uh, you know, the term uh, technically does come from uh, a Christian context, um, you know, initially in the context of Latin American Catholicism, but very soon after, um, you know, uh, forms of, of Protestant uh, Christianity in the United States, particularly from uh, the Black American experience. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, it was a way of approaching Christianity uh, from the perspective of the marginalized, um, realizing that the message of the Bible and uh, the way of, of Jesus was one deeply rooted in caring for the other, the other being, um, you know, whether it's the impoverished, uh, the poor, uh, the downtrodden, or, you know, in, in, in more contemporary struggles, um, you know, other kinds of, of you know, um, experiences related to uh, gender or sexuality. Um, yeah, liberation theology comes as a critique to uh, what's known as accommodationist or the theology of the powerful. So in Islam, like other religions, um, we've always had the same dynamic, you know, and in many ways, just as Christian liberation theology might uh, look at, uh, you know, the Christianization of the Roman Empire uh, during the time of Emperor uh, Constantine as the moment where you have, you know, the theology of the powerful now coming into uh, uh, conflict with the theology that was preached by the prophets and, and, and Jesus. In Islam, we also have this at an early time where, um, you know, an early uh, caliphate uh, kind of becomes a representation of, 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 of a state Islam that in many ways betrays the principles of the initial prophetic community. And I'm referring here to the Islamic notion of, of the prophet, as in the prophet Muhammad. Um, and in more contemporary times, um, you know, there's been a number of, of Muslim thinkers and, 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 and Islamic movements that are viewing their interpretation of Islam uh, from this, uh, yeah, from this perspective. We have a very nifty phrase in the Quran uh, about, um, uh, uh, it's, it's, yeah, it's a very central concept uh, uh, of, of God taking a side with uh, the mustada'afun. Uh, and the mustada'afun literally means those who have been oppressed. Um, and uh, so uh, Islamic liberation theology, in, in not too dissimilar a way to other liberation theology traditions, is looking at Islam from the perspective of the marginalized and the oppressed in different contexts. Um, to give an example, I came to South Africa to study what, with one of the world's leading Muslim liberation theologians. Um, his name is Dr. Farid Essak, um, and he was involved in an organization here, in a, an Islamic organization that was involved in the anti-apartheid struggle. And they very much approached the struggle from this religious perspective of, um, you know, in, in, in a liberationist Islam, but one that was in solidarity with the you know the seemingly non-islamic other you know so theology does not become this uh abstraction theology in many ways is a second act like diana was saying action is more important than you know abstracted belief so we find our faith as muslims or jews or christians or buddhists or people who are believing in something you know not traditionally defined in praxis um, and not just in, you know, kind of a scholastic, uh, you know, what does this word mean in Aramaic and what is this word in Arabic or Hebrew? And this is really, we have to be authentic about what this, you know, it's, it's we're not saying that's not important. That's a part of, you know, especially when you want to, to come to things like law and what do the Ten Commandments mean? <laughs> you know, so if I can just quickly uh, jump to that point, you know, we, we live in a world that... Uh, um, I mean, it depends where you are, but, you know, the, in the modern world, the secular takes precedence over the religious, you know, and, and many people have actually experienced this as a form of racist violence. Um, and, uh, and, you know, so on one hand, you want to say that, you know, reclaiming religion is, is one way to challenge forms of secularism that, uh, 
look down upon ways of being and ways of understanding life that you know are beyond just pure rationality of the human mind and you want to be able to affirm people who go to their scripture to say hey look this is how we want to regulate our life this is how we want to talk about our code of ethics and, and the way that we go about society as it relates to to legal codes but then it, when you bring in the question of not just religion but which religion <laughs> You know, that's where I think a conversation around something like the Ten Commandments, you know, or uh, different concepts that could, we could relate to in, in, in the Sharia or, um, you know, in, in, in Jewish law. You know, it's, it's not just a given, uh, the, these abstract Ten Commandments or these abstract concepts. We need to understand that they, can be, they need to be contextualized and approached with care or else you know, they could be coming from a form of white Christian nationalism that is not really <laughs> interested in reclaiming religion for the sake of the oppressed and greater social justice. Yeah, and I think that's absolutely where they're coming from in, in uh, Louisiana. And boy, it must be uncomfortable to be a minority uh, faith child in that. And Diana, your thoughts on... Um... Yeah, one of the interesting things I'm I'm digging into Walter Wink's work, but he talks a little bit about the symbol, his faith being a symbol and a bit of a language. So he tells a story about going to this retreat where they had them like sing in a pool as a way to like embody a little bit more of like creativity. And he said that for him, he had his greatest breakthrough when he was reciting scripture or the Lord's Prayer or a psalm. And what he says is he doesn't think, and other people were doing um, poems or mantras or something from their traditions, but he's like, I don't think that one over the other is the linchpin. He's like, I think it's because my oppression came from my religion and so when i'm looking for freedom it is oftentimes going to come from the symbol of my religion and for him um that was through the scripture and so when i look at the ten commandments being plopped down in a state <laughs> and what that really means i think it looks a lot more to me like a power play of planting a symbol of one group more than like what Alexander said, which I am so grateful for and interested where he was saying that, are we using our theology and our faith for greater social justice? Are we using it to bring um, the marginalized, the impressed, you know, into equality because that's how we all thrive. I don't really think that those 10 commandments are being plopped in Louisiana to be, um, to be practiced or to honor or to stop the killing because they indeed have um, the death penalty. I don't think they're going to use do not kill as a way to address their gun violence or address the women and minorities and kids who often are at the other end of gun violence. I think it does look like a symbol and a powerful way to plant their symbol in a public space and in all the schools as a way to um, leverage power. Yeah, thank you. Um, so uh, similarly, along these lines, we know, um, and three of us representing three different faiths here, that I think any faith can be used um, rather than liberatory as oppressive. And, uh, you know, from it from its own text, often, right? And so, um, you know, for example, in Judaism, we grapple with, uh, there's a lot of exclusion of other people in our historic texts, right, with us as as chosen and other people not chosen. Um, and uh, so moving that to like, to uh, I'll start with you, Iskandar, um, how do you reconcile environmentalism and interfaith work and uh, liberation of LGBTQ plus folks um, as well within 
uh, the ways that our faith can can be used either for liberation or in other times um, in, a, in a way of confining and Yeah. Um, look, I don't. I don't think it's an it's an easy one, Ariel. Um, I don't think it's an easy one. I mean, on one hand, uh, we like to rhetorically make claims, uh, and I do think it's important for us to to feel motivated and motivate others to say, "Yes, we know, and this is the truth." You know. <laughs> We should have that right to make the claim that this is what faith means to us, you know, a liberatory understanding. Um, but it is difficult when you deal with actual communities and actual texts and actual, you know, um, how ma the majority of a religious group are interpreting their faith. So, you know, um, on the question of environmentalism in Islam, um, I think in theory, you know, that's a relatively less difficult one um, to, to approach because uh, it's very difficult um, in, in, in reading the Quran um, to, to come to the conclusion, you know, that um, the creator is against his own creation. Um, but, um, you know, then, then, it all, then it becomes a question of, okay, you're, you're, you're citing all these nice verses in, in the Quran, or these sayings of the prophet, or this this good-looking Sufi poetry, um, you know, that that teaches us that we're one with nature and we should be respecting, uh, you know, the non-human other, um, and that's beautiful. We need that, you know. We need kind of a change in in mind. We need a change in philosophy. Um, but then, you know, when it comes to the hard mechanisms of what is changing the environment which is capitalist ecology. And I mean, frankly, the, the American military, that's the largest polluter in the world. It causes the most environmental damage in the history of humankind. It has caused the most environmental damage in the history of humankind, you know? So we need to bring in kind of more concrete material questions of what economic and political system are we speaking about when we want to say our faith has something to say about environmentalism. So, you know, one of the things I looked at in, in, in my research is, you know, um, it's not just a question of kind of philosophical environmental liberation, but so, social ecological liberation. And, you know, for me, Islam promotes a type of socialism and I'm, I, I have attempted to update that to an eco-socialism. Um, and there's very beautiful, deep ways that this is recognized in the Quran. Um, you know, one verse talks about umamun uh, amthalukum, nations just like you. God is speaking to humankind, and He's referring to other nations of creatures. And this reference is pretty generalized and broad to refer to all types of non-human creatures, whether plant, insect, you know, living, non-living. Um, and in a way, you know, that provides a, a far more social and communal framework for thinking about not a mononationalism, which is what happens with, you know, white nationalism or Christian supremacist nationalism or Jewish supremacist nationalism or Islamic supremacist nationalism, but really allowing a place for, 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 for many places to you know, a plural nationalism. Um, and, um, you know, I kind of look at that in relation to human and non-human nations. But if we want to look at another context, very pertinent to our times, Israel-Palestine, you know, I think it's, it's very difficult to think of this um, land and peoples as, as, as being able to have two separate countries at this point. You know, um, I think in many ways to allow a, a land for multiple peoples and nations to exist is really what it... It was before and can be again. Um, so I'm, I'm sorry I wasn't able to get to some of these other ones that you asked, uh, Ariel. And it and it drove me a different direction. In uh, I want to use a quote from from Walter, and and I'll, I'll speak a bit to um, my own thoughts on that. You know, as as you spoke about Israel Palestine, and 
you know, my people are there. Um, uh, and uh, there's often, you know, a, about half of the Jewish population in the world. We're a small percentage of the world and about half of us are there. And so there's no time and way that I don't care what's happening there. And uh, I think of my people there by and large as 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 broken right now, like deeply, a deeply broken society, um, drunk on militarism and nationalism and revenge and uh, with, um, a, a hateful movement growing rapidly as well, um, uh, often termed um, Kahanism. But uh, anyway, I could I could go on. There's a youth movement there built on hate and exclusion, and it's growing in popularity. And so, you know, to say like brokenness, right? Brokenness. And so, Diana. Um, this helps me to like think about it. So I want to read this quote from, from Walter and just say what comes to mind, I guess. Uh, there is no one and surely no entire people in whom the image of God has been utterly extinguished. Faith in God means believing that anyone can be transformed regardless of the past. To write off whole groups of people as intrinsically racist and violent is to accept the very same premise that upholds racist and oppressive regimes. I do you have a specific direction you want me to go Not with entirely. this quote? <laughs> Not entirely. I guess we could um. think of like um uh, you know, to write off whole groups of people as as intrinsically racist or violent. And in some of those ways, we can look at, at you know, portions of the United States or, you know, it was it was ringing yeah. true for me as I think of uh, my people in Israel as a society that I think of as as broken. So, um, yeah, yeah, I think that the the fast the curious thing about that is across all of he all of history and in many places as as countries we have been racist and we have been violent and yet there is still this hope and there is still this promise that we don't have to stay that way that there's possibility in us and i feel like i experienced that very personally that I had possibility if I was invited to something better. And so in his quote, there's a little bit I hear of that. Um, something I often tell people is that if you were raised and told that you are the right religion and you're in the right country and you're on the right side of the conflict and you're wearing the right military uniform, then you're the good guys, which means that anybody else is automatically in the bad guy bucket, which is a shortcut because then you never have to question your own actions. Are they right? Are they true? Are they an atrocity? Are they not? And then you never really have to look at the other people and say, what are they doing? What about their, um, their humanity? What about their actions? And it's just this really easy shortcut that means that we don't have to question our motives. We don't have to question our actions. And then we dehumanize anybody else who is at the other end of what we want. And I think that's the most important. And in some ways, I think Walter Wink's phrase there is asking us, knowing that most of us are told we're the right people, to notice that somebody else is not beyond repair or redemption. But... I, want, I have a friend, and he's also on death row in Alabama. And one of the things that he told me, because I live in Minnesota, which is where George Floyd was killed, and my youngest son is also African-American, and he's a teenager watching this happen. And my dad was also in law enforcement. And so we're watching the whole world ache and cry out for justice. And... We've been writing, we've been pen pals for like five years. And I remember him writing me, telling me that he did not agree with the sentencing 
of the policeman who murdered George Floyd. He said that it was inhumane. He said, Diana, if we ever sentence someone to more than 20 years in prison, we are denying their human ability to transform and to change. This is a black man on death row in Alabama for something that he would not be on death row for if he committed it in half of the other states. And he's, and I feel like that has always caught me that we, we can't undersell the possibility and the persistence that we have work to do. And if we refuse to collaborate with violence, if we take it off the table, then we have to show up and we have to change. And we're going to get somewhere where we are less racist and we're killing less folks because we're imagining a better and Martin Luther King was the first person I'd ever heard was a Christian and a pastor who believed in nonviolence and refused to allow us to settle, refused to accept one more day of violence and killing. So I think Walter Winks is heading in that direction for us. Um, but I think he would also go way, way farther. I think we have to go way farther than that and put some urgency on it because I also live on... I live near one of the largest Ojibwe reservations and the largest populated in all of Minnesota. And we are also home to the largest mass execution that has ever happened in the history of the United States. 38 Dakota men were sentenced to death and hanged in one day in Minnesota. Their crime, they stole five eggs from settlers, colonial settlers. And that was it. There was six weeks of conflict because Native Americans were put on reservations and they were hungry and they stole five eggs. And I think we need to continue to always side and always notice no matter. And I grew up here and I did not hear that story. I was not taught it in school. I grew up with um, Ojibwe folks everywhere. We all lived together, schools, home, work, never hearing the story that Native American people were marginalized, that they were oppressed, that they didn't choose to live on a reservation, that um, they were reservations were in the worst part of the county. It was it was a place nobody wanted to be. So I think it's a call to continue to refuse violence and refuse to accept the stories of people we've been told are other are not us, are on the other side of the conflict, the other side of what our people say we deserve. Thank you. So Iskander, I'm going to read another um, wink quote, but I first just want to preface it with, um, you know, I spoke about like, that my people matter to me, and I cannot imagine what it is as, as Palestinian, as Arab, to watch in real time and I you know a, a, a genocide and not that people throughout history haven't witnessed genocide of their people and felt helpless before but this is real time you know. and you know how to maintain um and, and anger is valid right and there are a lot of folks right now who, who watching this are angry and hurting and so on but uh so i want to read this this uh quote from walter and um and loving enemies and, and and get your thoughts the command to love our enemies reminds us that our first task towards oppressors is pastoral to help them recover their humanity quite possibly the struggle and the oppressive oppression that gave it rise have dehumanized the oppressed as well, causing them to demonize their enemies. It is not enough to become politically free. We must also become human. Nonviolence presents a change for all parties to rise above their present condition and become more of what God created them to be. Hmm. Yeah, um, you know, I think um, 
What resonates with me in in that quote by by Walter Wink is um, is a very important point um, about um, oppressors also being oppressed by their own oppression, um, and that as much as you know. Um, as much as freedom, you know, for an oppressed people presents freedom naturally to their oppressors, the one difficulty I find in kind of easily saying that is that, you know, just as um, oppressed people must make a choice to stand against their oppressors, oppressors must also make a choice to stand against themselves. So in one way, you would think that, you know, the freedom of the oppressed naturally leads to the freedom of the oppressor. In a certain way, yes. But in another way, you know, um, kind of on two sides of the coin, uh, oppressed people, uh, oppressed people can do messed up things, okay? Um, and oppressors don't naturally just come out of their oppression. And, you know, as a Muslim, um, that quote and thinking about you know this 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 subject reminds me of uh, a, a verse from the Quran that I think is really kind of at the heart of the struggle, you know, to be not only pointing the finger the finger at what's wrong, but also to realize those three fingers are being pointed back at you, you know, um, and the uh, yes this uh, this this verse uh, it's in the fourth chapter of the Quran. Um, and it goes, Ya ayyuhalladina amanu kunu qawamina bil qist shuhada alilla walau ala anfusikum awal walidain awal aqrabin. Which translates as, um, O oh, you who have attained to faith, uh, be steadfast in upholding justice and equity, being witness bearers to God, to the truth for the sake of God even if it means being against your own selves, your parents, and your kinfolk. Um, and the, the verse goes on uh, to say um, uh, whether the person concerned be rich or poor, uh, God's claim takes precedence over the claims of either of them. And do not then follow your own desires, lest you swerve from justice for if you are to distort the truth, behold, God is indeed aware of all that you do. So I don't think that's an easy one. I think that's a constant struggle um, and requires a constant reflection, you know, on, on multiple sides of the coin. You know, and if I can speak to our moment um, as a Palestinian, as a Muslim, and as someone involved, you know, in, in this struggle, um, you know, on, on, on if we look at October 7th, okay, on one hand, I think it's very, very difficult to equate quantifiably, you know, the violence of the oppressed with the violence of the oppressor. Yeah. I think that's very difficult to do, and, and we shouldn't. That doesn't mean we don't have questions, though, you know, and it doesn't mean that the oppressed cannot be problematic. Was what happened on October 7th problematic? I think so. Where they oppressed the problem? No, not at all. You know, the problem is Zionism. The problem is colonialism. The problem is imperialism. And, um, you know, um, I really hope and dream of a future um, as I'm, I'm, I'm sure you know, you, you may share Ariel coming from from your community where, um, you know, Zionism can no longer be a force that that traps, you know, the Jew and the non-Jew in a relationship of of really that's really destructive. But it's going to take just as it'll take a lot of reflection, you know, on our side to understand that. Hey, look, you know. Uh, resistance by any and all means is not always necessarily true, you know, it's also going to take a lot of conscious reflection 
um, on the side of the oppressor to say, how the hell are we really going to get out of this? I don't have an answer, but I do think that that's, that's a serious and constant struggle. Yeah, I, I struggle with that so many, so many middle of the nights, like, how does this ever repair? And with the damage being done in each moment greater, how does this how does this repair both internally for each of us, right? For for each peoples, um, for the oppressors to, like I said, repair from the brokenness that that comes with committing oppression and militarization and fanaticism, and as well to the oppressed who have been are being so injured in the moment physically and psychically as well you know because it also it also creates hatred and feelings of revenge that that recycle itself um diana talks about mortal injury sometimes and um yeah like how do we and uh so i'm going to end with one final quote from from uh, Walter and let each of you uh, speak to it, whoever wants to go first and trying to move to, um, you know, cause with that, I, I, yeah, feel despair so often about this and don't have, you know, people ask me like, well, what do you think the solution is? And I'm like, I don't see one, but um, yet <laughs> as some of my Palestinian friends have said like, uh, pessimism is 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 a trait of uh, is a trait of privilege. It's a privilege, you know, to be able to be pessimistic. We who struggle for our for our freedom. This was a, a you know a friend of mine in in Palestinian city of Hebron. Like we don't have that. We don't have that. You know, we have to be optimistic. We we have to have hope. So um, so I like this quote from Walter for that way and in uh i guess what gives each of you hope or such but uh from walter there is nothing from dna to the united nations that does not have god at its core everything has a spiritual aspect everything is answerable to god whichever one of you <laughs> It gives me some hope, I think, that quote. Mm. Yeah, I hope. And yet, knowing how much Christian nationalism has made God into um, just the next warrior version, um, part of me is always like, ooh, when people start, you know, using the big G-O-D, I'm like, well, what, what are you talking about? Are you talking about the one who, you know, like, smites everybody or... <laughs> so I guess for me, when I think of God, I do come to it through the person of Jesus. And that person always championed the marginalized. That's the person who refused to kill even when his life was taken. That's the person who kept having hope in us and chose, um, called out the sword and said, if you live by the sword, you're going to die by the sword. So I feel like I have hope that the universe is bent towards justice. I have hope that there's always a small group of humanity who will sacrifice and raise their voice for all of us to lay down the ways that we oppress. And I want that for my kids. I'm raising two teenage boys and I know about their dignity and their honor. And the greatest thing I can ever give them is they're refusing to harm another person. Like that's true freedom. That's the life that is gonna blow them out of the water. And that's my hope, is that all of this violence will bring up this rot of accepting human beings as collateral damage, of accepting things that are really just cancerous to us. So I that is my hope that the more that we can get loud and the more we can expose what has never been okay, um, that we have a chance of growing something better than this. Um, but I'd love to hear what your what your thoughts are, Alexander. Um, 
I don't know. <laughs> Do I need to share my thoughts? No. I think you explained things very nicely, Diana. And I think not knowing is is actually a thought, right? Well, Alexander, you're the nicest theologian I've ever met because I've always been really intimidated by pastors, theologians. <laughs> like they always <laughs> seem to like, I'm always like, oh no, the principal's in town because they know every verse and, you know, they tend to be a little bit militant. <laughs> so I am just really encouraged and honored to be in in your presence and getting to learn from you and hear your story because if there's anything that we gives me hope is that we are bringing three faiths together and pointing them in the same direction um which is liberation so thank you for being so kind <laughs> to me <laughs> well i have to say this has been one of my favorite gathering voices it's felt very open ended and um genuine and uh, interesting uh, to me personally. And uh, so I want to invite everybody to journey with us for the next two years with Diana and Iskandar as our fellows. There will be um, times that you will, that we will offer, that they will offer writing, you know, reflections, um, thoughts on Walter, book book club readings all, all kinds of things and and much to be unknown and uh, as of yet but but to come uh so um we didn't get a chance to take questions but if folks have questions you can send them to um info at forusa.org and Diana and Iskander will do their best to <laughs> answer any that apply to them. Um, but yeah, I really want to welcome both of you uh, to this fellowship and invite everybody to um, to uh, take in those gifts as well as uh, we go through this. So thank you all. And uh, thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Ariel. Thanks, everyone. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you all for spending some time to meet us. It is an honor to get to be here with you. And Alexander, South Africa, I feel like this is a very international, exciting uh, webinar <laughs> I got to be on today. <laughs> so thank you. Well, we, we can all see, I mean, it's always in these things, we'd love to, I'd love to hear from so many of the people here, you know, everyone has so much to contribute. Yeah, so. But so alas, much. the milit the militant theologians don't shut up, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll just remind everyone as well that uh, we will be uh, sending out information how to get Diana's uh, book as well, and more information to come as, as um, we do these fellowships. Thanks so much for joining us. Thank you all.